whether you agree personally with it or not, uh, how many of you are in an enterprise where you never, where you always plan? You always plan for the projects you're going to do, ISD kinds of projects or HPT. So a couple of you, three of you. Okay, how many of you, sometimes you plan, but not always. Okay, more of you. And how about um, never ever plan? So you're all doing some sort of plan. Okay. Um, why is it that you choose to sometimes plan and sometimes not plan? What's some of the reasons? What's the criteria you're using or whatever? Yes? Well, it, it was probably has to do with my definition of planning because for me, planning is thorough and there's a process. And that, when that doesn't happen, I'm saying that we're not planning. And that often it's because of time constraints. This is your own defense. We need it a week from now. Go. No time to plan. Right. Okay. Other reasons? Yeah. It's the same thing for me. Quite often I'm responding uh, quite rapidly. What may or may not be a solution. Mm -hmm. How many of you are involved in non trading solutions that you're doing besides the ISD kind of Okay. Um, my background is that uh, I got into the biz, the learning biz, the training development biz back in 79, and we always planned, and I always learned to plan, and planned with my clients. And I learned long ago that it should be my client's plan not necessarily mine. They had to buy into it, they had to support it, they had to enable us to serve them because they had the expertise that we needed to tap into and then we do our magic with the expertise and create you know, performance-based, performance-relevant kind of content. Um, I have four session objectives here. The first is to help you clarify for your situational context, what are the criteria that you need your project planning needs, you know, how rigorous does it need to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Second of all, I'm going to talk about a macro planning framework that's appropriate to your situational context. So you're going to have to kind of create your own, and we can help you here with doing that. But you know, every situation is different, every context is different, what surrounds you, what you need to interconnect with is different, and so this needs to kind of accommodate that. But within the macro framework, I'm going to talk about a micro framework that I'm going to show you my example that was works for me. It's worked for 25 plus years uh, doing this kind of thing. And, what, and ask you to adapt it to your needs because it looks a certain way for my needs in my specific context. Uh, I just went through training uh, my staff at Wachovia on these methods because I found that they rarely plan for any of their instructional design projects. Uh, they usually just jump right into development, you know, rapid development. Um, for big things and little things, and when we went rapid development, big things about design or development, uh, analysis in front of that, that leads to lots of rework. I call that rework city, and I hate to go to rework city. I've been trying to avoid rework or minimize rework my entire professional career. So I hate doing rework. Um, so we'll talk about your context, a macro planning framework that's appropriate for you, depending on what you're building, a micro planning framework to fit within that, and it's just a pattern that I use. And so I'll share that with you, talk about that, and then have you adapt it. And then we'll talk about some uh, management strategies. Once you have a plan in place, how do you manage to plan? What are some of the issues, some of the things that you might use? And we'll be sharing here, hopefully, a lot of what you're already doing. Okay? But first, why bother with any of this? What's in it for you? What's in it for your stakeholders? What's in it for uh, your enterprise? And I have been in situations where people use extremely complicated project planning methods and tools. And I say overkill in the extreme. It's just not appropriate for the kinds of projects that we're doing. Sometimes it's necessary for certain projects, but most of the time it's not. And when I see organizations try to play, do project planning at an extreme level for simple efforts, then that's when management pushes back and doesn't want to do any of that because it is too time consuming on the front end. It does take up more time than you have to do that, and it's unnecessary. So it's, you need something that's scalable, something for simple efforts, and maybe you don't even need to plan at times. So there's cases where that would be appropriate, not to plan at all. Um, but I believe that when it's necessary and you do plan, you'll get better outputs. You will have given yourself the time so you're not scrambling doing a halfway job because you didn't get enough time to do it properly. Whether that's doing the analysis portion of, a, of an effort or a design or a development, and that's of course applicable to more than instructional design projects. You'd be creating a new 
compensation system had to do with analysis, design, development, implementation of pilot testing, those kinds of things. So I think you get a better output. I think you get things done faster if you avoid rework. The rework is what slows everything down and adds to the cycle time and adds to the cost. So you can actually get it done cheaper as well. But again, it's got to be at the appropriate level of planning for the appropriate effort that you're going to expend. Um, anyway, this is, these are my biases. I force everybody I had was, I ran consulting firms. I was a partner in consulting firms for 25 years. I mean, all of my consultants that worked for me plan their projects. We were selling our services to our clients. They had to know what we were going to be doing, when we were going to be doing it, how we were going to be doing it, and when they had to support us and show up, and all the timing of things was important. And then I was doing fixed fee pricing. And in 25 years as a consultant, I never did a change order. Because when I worked at companies before I was a consultant, I got change ordered to death. And I hated it. So I never wanted to do that. I never wanted to have a reputation. So I want to make sure we could all agree that this plan is feasible, is appropriate to the needs in a situational context. And that gave us enough wiggle room to deal with Murphy. <clears throat> you all know what Murphy is? Murphy's Law? If anything can go, possibly go wrong, it probably will. So you have to plan for that. And so that's built into how I think about planning touch time versus cycle time. And we will get into that. It's a very important thing here to understand where do you need to leave yourself the room for recovery? Because something might slip. You know, it's, you try to avoid it, but if it's unavoidable, how do you plans are dealing with it. Did you think about that proactively on the front end? Where will it possibly go wrong and where do I leave myself a little bit of room for that? And if you're multitasking, you do multi projects at one time, you're, you're kind of trying to balance maybe perhaps lots of things all at once. That was my situational context in the past. So ready or not, here we go. <clears throat> so assessing your situation. Um, can, can you use a simple Addy like Framework. How many of you actually use Addy as a framework? To... Okay. So, are you using the pure Addy just as it is, the five blocks? Have you adapted it somehow? Okay. Many of you have adapted. It. Um, do you sometimes need to integrate with other work streams, like you're doing an instructional design project or an HPT project, but it's tied into lots of other efforts, a more complicated thing? Yes. Several of you. See, has nodding. Okay. Good. So. You might have sometimes, do you have a simple context where you're just doing a instructional project, it's all by itself, and sometimes it's integrated into something larger? So you have to have more than one way to do that. So you, one size approach will not fit. Well, that's important. Okay. I have a hard time finding the room myself. I wandered and wandered and wandered. All right, so sometimes you can use an Addy framework, sometimes it's that the Addy thing might be okay, but it has to be reflected in a larger model where you may not be in charge. You may have to be fitting your Addy model, your phased approach to things in somebody else's macro structure. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Sometimes you need to do both. Um, who needs to be included in your plan when you're planning? Who are you including? You, your efforts, maybe people on the instructional design or HPT team. Who else do you include in your plan? Stakeholders? Okay, what kind of stakeholders? Business unit leaders. Say again? Business unit leaders. Business unit leaders. Okay, leadership. Money people. Pardon? The money people. The money people, yeah. <laughs> Many times that's really important. That's not always in some context, but certainly, yeah, they may want to know. Sometimes it's the uh, supplier of a certain uh, piece of equipment. Suppliers of the different people's equipment, your own performers, representatives from the target audience perhaps. There's, there's a cast of characters, many roles that might be involved. In the <coughs> so it's important to, of course, engage them, make sure that they are cognizant of the plan, they buy into the plan, and that, that sometimes gives tricky, especially if people don't like that. What would help you communicate and help uh, others translate the plan? You have to communicate with these stakeholders and that, and how do you go about doing that? Is it just you give them the plan and that's it? What else are you using? We have assessment questionnaire templates uh, that we use depending on the situation. Okay. Uh, just to, to get us even started in terms of what the objectives are by the project sponsor. That's how you capture all that data? And then how do you share that back out so that you basically communicate to everybody what the deal is, what the plan is to go forward, and how 
how that, what, what mechanisms are you using? We use our product. Pardon? We use product WPS work breakdown structures. Okay, work breakdown structures? Before we even get to that, we'll use a project scope document where we kind of define what's in scope and what's out of scope okay. and then identify the stakeholders and get assigned. And, and then you share that with others, right? Do you do presentations? Do you have any presentations of management? Do you have one-on-one -on -one meetings with certain people? Are those the kind of mechanisms that you might use to share this? Right, emails. I used to use uh, brochures and things like that. Put together a little colorful brochure, explain to everybody in simple terms what the deta more detailed project plan included. It was the executive summary kind of thing, and I would socialize that with people and point out key things that I thought were pro potentially problematic to them, necessary to the project, but perhaps they're not going to like this one. <laughs> and so I just wanted to get that out early and often and see if they could live with it, or they could work around it, or whether we were going to have to adjust those plans. Um, so these, I think, are the kinds of things that you need to, to, to figure out for your own situation, and I'm sure many of you have, but this is what the kinds of questions you have to ask yourself is, what, what kind of frameworks do I need? Do I need to really integrate with lots of other frameworks? Do I need to do this both sometimes? And who needs to be included in the plan? I'm planning for what resources, people, and things, so what do I need to include in that plan? because I'm going to have to check their scheduled availability. A room, perhaps, size, people, facilities, etc. So, and then how do I communicate to help others to translate? And is that built into my project planning efforts? Because I think that's important. And it's the kind of thing we'll talk about in milestone reviews and such. Okay. Any other needs or criteria that you have when you are developing plans and communicating plans? Anything else that you need? Yes? Participation from the stakeholders and the people who have to buy in. Right. They need to participate. You need to sell them on that. You need to, I think you need to show them in the plan where, they do, where they're supposed to show them to do their thing and what that thing is. Or potentially, depending on what you're doing, if they, need, they may need to even help develop the plan pending. Um, yes. where I recently had a client where I, I knew there was no buy-in until they did it. They mm -hmm. finally, I have a project plan in the last three months because they, they created the plan. Yep. Okay. Now, I work with my clients to create the plan with them and make sure that you know I have this we were doing that. framework. It wasn't color. working. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. So you just had to turn the whole thing over to them. Yeah, and I finally say, okay. How do you want this you done? You tell me. Yeah. That's good too. So, you can so just look at the client because you may have to do different adjustments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So lots of messiness here, and if you're dealing with the same client over and over again. Well, you eventually can kind of negotiate some state of nirvana where you can both coexist. But if you have lots of different clients, then you're having to adjust all the time to folks, and that's even trickier. All right. Um, of course, this is the Addy model. Uh, you should all be familiar with that. This is my adaptation of Addy going back into the uh, late 80s. But I never like jumping into analysis without some sort of a planning step first. Uh, some people might push back and say, well, guy, analysis is actually includes that project priming element. Okay, no, I can buy that. But I like it to be more visible, but before we jump into analysis, let's do some project planning and kickoff. So it's important to me to get the stakeholders all together and do all that. But this is just simply my adaptation of that. And I've changed the, implement oops, I've changed the implementation. Um, but so I made an adaptation of that myself. Uh, some of you may uh, be in the Six Sigma world and have to tie into domain, right? And so you, your situation may require that that's always a given or sometimes part of your effort and then you need to tie into that, right? There's, this is a, something I pulled off the web here, you can see the source down here in the bottom, right? But basically a new product development model, and there are many, many of them I've seen over the years, but uh, as new products are being developed, you, your part of your efforts might be tying in and developing content to support that rollout for various people that are going to be involved in whatever uh, changes happen or new stuff that's a requirement of this product or service development effort. And something can be more complicated, such as this. This is maybe not the best example, but there's many work screens here, and you might be just but one of them. And so how do you tie in? When does your A end and your first D begin, given the context of a larger set of efforts? How is that going to work? And that's sometimes what people need to plan. <clears throat> anyway, so the point is there's many different situational contexts that you can find yourself in, and some of you may have a varied set, and some of you may have a fairly stable and a standard set. 
Um, so assessing your situation, this leads, these are the questions that I'm going to ask you to do in an exercise. There's four little exercises here. If you're from the same firm, you might want to huddle together and do this. Otherwise, you do this on your own because it's all about your context and not some generic context. So what would be the smart things to do here? What do you have to tie into? Can you borrow frameworks from elsewhere? Can you borrow the DMAE framework and, and use that as your macro framework? And how, and how do you then adapt the ADDIE type of approach to a DMAE type of approach? Um, do you need to borrow language and terms and, 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 and uh, uh, get rid of all of our instructional jargon? Uh, you know, it's fine when we instructional folks or HPT folks are talking amongst ourselves. Doctors, they go to medical conferences, they talk in the language of medicine. Bedside manner dictates that they don't do that. You know, and our desk side manner with our clients should require that we don't talk in our same instructional jargon. But we may need to adapt our language to the language of our customers. I would adapt my ADDIE approaches to things to engineering companies and use their language and just borrow all of their language their new product development processes and use the same kind of wording that they're using. Work breakdown structures is a great example of borrowing something from the engineering world. So you need to do that. You need to borrow visuals and imagery from inside your organization as they show models of how they do things. Their new product development process is one of them. Can you borrow and adapt those kinds of things to your use to make it easier for others to understand what the heck you're talking about? Because you're trying to talk in their language and using their kind of imagery to help you. What else might you borrow or adapt or adopt if you can? What have you used from in your organizations, in your context? Yes? Well, when I do um, training, assessment, job analysis, etc., I work for an organization that falls within the intelligence community, the greater intelligence community. And what I've had to do now is redefine what's entry level, redefine what's senior, what's expert, so that my definitions map directly to the IC definition of those. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes? It's, it's interesting about borrowing the language and terms because where I'm at is an engineering center. Mm -hmm. We develop and design the training for the systems that are being developed and designed. So they, we work with a lot of engineers. Yes. And what I find is easy here is it's all a same, it's a system. So I kind of put that in their perspective. Like when you design a system, you have to analyze. So we, that's what we do too. So a lot of the project managers for the systems kind of understand that now. Yeah, that I found over the years, again, going back to uh, 79 when I started doing all this, uh, that engineering and technical groups will embrace our approach to things like an ADDIE model once they've demystified it and decoded it and figured it out what that is. Oh, you mean requirements definition. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what you call it, right? And what do, you, what do you call the design thing, I would ask? And they might have different answers because different companies, you know, there's no standards out there you would, you would think that there would be, but there aren't, and every company would be a little bit different in terms of how they look at adapted language for their own internal purposes. But I think that's the smart thing to do. I think the hardest group I've ever had to work with is the marketing and sales organizations. Because they'd rather have fun than do the VEC, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, out of the golf courses, we can make sales, so we don't plan anything other than for example. All right, so for this little exercise here, I'd like you to take just three minutes and quickly answer the questions about your situational needs and just give that a little thought. So, as you were to create your own frameworks for project planning, what are the specific things that you're going to adapt to? What kinds of language in that? We've talked about this a little bit, but I'd just like you to spend a couple minutes just uh, capturing that for yourselves. Okay, so this is the equivalent of doing analysis or requirements definition. This is what how you will assess now as we go through the uh, additional exercises here to create these things. What you want to test back on and say, am I am I meeting my own requirements here? If my situation kinds of requires these things here. Of course, we've got a very short time here. You might want to give us an additional thought here, but this is a start. So you, you may not have the perfect thing to think walking out of the door here, but maybe you've had a start. Maybe let's give you some food and thought how to think about what your planning models look like and how well do they work for you as well as all the other stakeholders that are uh, involved and need to be bought into the whole thing. Okay. Um, 
anybody got anything that came to mind here that we didn't discuss earlier? So you're going to look at models that you're going to adapt. Can you adapt to models? You said some of you said that before. You have uh, other models from your customers' world, perhaps, that you're going to just adapt or adopt to meet your needs.
when, when are things happening in all the other work streams where I can have clarity and actually finish my analysis and when can I start my analysis because data will be coming from these other work streams but it won't end until I get to this point here. So when will I be able to start? When will I be able to include my analysis? When will I be able to see, test out my design against the other aspects of whatever we're putting out there? If we're doing a larger HPT kind of thing and instruction is maybe one piece, or we're putting in other equipment, and we're changing compensation systems, or measurement systems, or whatever. And I need to train certain target audiences on that. I've got to look at these other work streams and figure out when can I be able to start? When will I be able to end? And if I'm producing more than one deliverable, I may need to look at it in a more complicated way. Here's where for the one first deliverable for one target audience, I'll be able to start and conclude my analysis steps. And for my second deliverable for a second target audience, here's where I'll be able to start and end that. So it'll make my model much more complicated. In fact, I may have several mini work streams within my own work stream. Get this kind of a view. Does that make sense? Um, so I would like you to, we're going to go right into the other exercise here. So I'd like you to draw out your macro framework for simple efforts where you're doing an HPT or an ISD thing all by itself, not encumbered by having to connect with a lot of other, other work stream efforts. So maybe yours is just the add your model. That's all. So it might be quite simple for you. And if you have a more complicated situation where you do have to fit it within many other work streams, can you draw yourself a picture of that? And what does that mean? And if it's too varied and your context has too many variations of that, just pick one. Because this leads to the looking at the micro framework I'm going to talk about next and how will that fit into your macro framework. That's all we were trying to accomplish. Is a good point. Right. That 
maybe spiral one will have you know bare minimum of training because it's, and then we'll have to go back and evaluate what we did. Are they releasing different uh, system components, or are they releasing different iterations of it and increasing fe feature upgrades and all those kinds of things that's going on? Yeah. So whatever you latched onto that, and you're in those efforts here. You, you know, you're you're going to be enhancing the feature upgrades of your content as they're doing the same thing with their. Right, and we might be in the evaluation phase at the same time of the training that we're doing the design phase because right. we're moving, we're doing it all parallel. Right. It's got a lot of overlapping efforts in yeah. the parallel world. You can't work in series. You're part right. of a, you know, you're you're part of the, you're not the, you're the dog is being what you're the tail is being wagged. You're not the dog that's wagging, right? Yeah, we don't, and we don't have the, the, well, we do now, but initially it was like we had no opportunity to analyze because nobody really knew what to analyze. Nobody knew what the system was really going to look like because uh -huh. <laughs> they were just defining their requirements. Right. So. But being part and privy to that effort, that gives you some insight about what might be coming. You begin to think about, you know, who's the target audience and how you might deploy this and yada, yada, yada. You may not have the real content that you be able to start framing things and at least uh, getting ready earlier um, and not working in this a pure series of steps here. You may be jumping around uh, in your own mental model. Exactly. But that's what you need to plan for. So if, you, if you're interested in understanding resource consumption, you know, do I have enough uh, body count to actually support this in that time frame? What are the other efforts our organization is working on? So sometimes it's critical that you actually get a handle on this, a better handle. Again, coming from a consulting perspective here, I had a staff of consultants that I had to have working on multiple projects simultaneously. And they, they had certain scheduled events. And they had to be in this city at this you know date doing this particular thing. And we just had to block all that out and manage ourselves for as many projects. Many of you probably have a similar situation where you're not working on just one thing until you're done and then you turn around and start a new one here. You gotta work on multiple things here, trying to get better resources. Anybody else have any particular challenges in their context in the macro frameworks that they have to enable and support? Yes? Well, since we are implementing new And if, it, if you're in a world there where they don't have hard set milestones and all we know is that we're going to get at this certain point here and then it's going to start iteration and, and changes depending on what happens, you can't then plan hard milestone dates for things, but you can certainly anticipate in your plan that there's probably going to be iterative work, their own rework city that you're going to be dragged to with them and along for the ride. And if you've got to plan your time, at least you can at least can't be perfect in predicting when that's going to be and how much effort is going to be required, but at least you can be mindful of it and schedule your time accordingly and leaving yourself more of that wiggle room for Murphy. Yes, sir. What we do is we, we sit down and we have a, a, a pre meeting with all the stakeholders and we get buy in and we identify who's going to be attached to the project. Mm -hmm. and then what we do is we have what we call a plan and action of milestones and we sit down, okay. You're going to get me all the, the names of the accomplished performers and their email addresses by this date. Mm -hmm. all right. We're going to put the survey together and we're going to say <coughs> all these accomplished performers that you gave us email address by this date. And we go through the whole adding model for design, mm -hmm. development, you know, all the way down the whole list from the entire mm -hmm. project. Yes, I think that's, that's the important thing to do. If you're not tied into 17 other works for yourself. You know, well, even still, I mean, you, you, if because I'm working multiple projects at one time, but I, mm -hmm. I still do the same thing. So I, I already know that all right, I got to have this done for the other project by this date. Right. So I, st I still can I can factor that in. Well, well why is it taking so long? <coughs> my project I'm working on, I have another project that I have a due right. date this week, so that's why I'm pushing it back one more week. I get into those details when I get into the micro portion of this. So if you're using Addy, that is your macro framework, if you can make that work. Even in multiple work streams, you're just doing Addy, 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 wherever you need to do here. So when, when, oh, so let me just go to the next question. 
All right, so developing a micro framework, if you have a macro framework and that was Addy or something else, demand or whatever it is, now you have, can you establish a pattern of things? And this is what I learned to do back in the 80s. And I started talking about it, writing about it uh, probably in the early 90s. But I've been training my staff on this, and this is my micro framework. This is what I call an activity block diagram. Pretty simple. You'll, you'll be adapting this one here in the next exercise, but this is how I use it. There's the big conducted oval. That's what this is all about. It's, it's I'm going to do a survey, or I'm going to run an analysis team meeting, or I'm going to run a gate review meeting. That's the big hit. And because in my context, I had consultants at different uh, pay levels, at billable rate levels. I had uh, in-house staff that did all the word processing and graphics and all that kind of stuff. So I, this model was appropriate to my situation because of the staff that I had. This is what you, what you need to think about as you change and adapt something like this, because yours might even be more simple. You're the only one doing it, you do it all. You're going to do this uh, uh, prep for it. I don't know how to use this. Anyway, so there's a prep for stage, which my consultants needed to prepare to conduct whatever it was. And I had others on my staff that were coordinating logistics, booking the room, doing that. I didn't have a high paid consultant doing all of that stuff. I had a lower paid employee. Sorry that they didn't get paid as much as everybody else, but that's just the way it works in the real world. And so I had a divided conquer strategy. Who's going to do what? And I wanted to see in their project plans that I was going to put a fixed fee price on and never do a change order. No one was ever going to be able to do a change order in my organization. We would eat the loss before we would do a change order. And then we would, of course, learn from that. And I would ensure that the learning happened, right? So, but, but, so that was always important to me. So, you know, what, how much time are you going to spend preparing for it? What's the touch time on preparing for it? What's the touch time on conducting it? How many hours is that going to be, or days? And then you're going to document it after you did it. So how much time is the touch time going to be on document? And who's going to coordinate the logistics for it? Who's going to arrange the rooms? Who's going to make sure there's coffee there? Because the last thing we need is to start off an early morning meeting without any coffee, because then we hear grousing about that for the whole three-day meeting. <laughs> so you know, if you've been burned, you should have learned, right? <laughs> so, so that's my micro. <laughs> My, that's how I always look at this. And that's how I train my staff. I want you. I want to see it in your project plan task details. Preparing for it is where. Coordinating for it is where. Who's doing it? How much time did you give them to do it? Because I'm going to charge my customer based on that. I'll either offer to them the time and expense, and they take the risk of it taking longer or winning because it took shorter. Or I'll give them a fixed fee on it, and I'll show them exactly what I'm going to add. I'm going to add my time to the multiplication of the various rates. I'm going to slap 15 or 20 percent on there as my margin, and they could. And I would show all of my clients all of that. They got to choose which way they wanted to buy it. I always propose the two different ways: time and expense. You have the most of the risk, or you guarantee no risk to you. You know what the price is, and if you've been working with me before, you know that you're not going to change it. And if there was not enough clarity in a project, I never did the fixed fee stuff. I wasn't that stupid. If they couldn't figure out what's going to happen, and what, you know, anything could get wild and woolly in this thing here, then it was going to be just time and expense. But at least I could still map out what I thought it might take. And that's where we started off. How I did do the other things. But anyway, so that, that was my model of how I did this, my microactivity set. Prepare for it, coordinate for it, do it, document it. And then you're on to the next step. Okay. Uh, prep for it, coordinate for it, conduct it, document it. And so I had this little sheet that I would use, and I just trained some of my employees at Wachovia about this because they weren't into project planning unless they were the PMI experts. <coughs> had overkill in the extreme project planning methods and tools and everything else driving everybody, including my clients, crazy because they would have to do lessons learned after every task almost. You know, it was just seemed to be overkill. Um, but anyway, so this is how I ask people to think about it. I put a little bubble there because touch time is important. And that's the first thing I want to figure out. Because I don't, I'll figure out cycle time after I figure out touch time, right? Does that make sense? I've got to figure out how much time it's going to be taken to touch it. And then I'll say, if it takes me two days to touch that and do that, I might need it three or four days to get, get that two days worth of effort done. Unless there's absolutely no time in the project. 
and everything is slammed right up against each other with no wiggle room because sometimes the world insists that that's all you get to make it happen. So I still have to understand that so that I can tease out and figure out where is it likely to go wrong? Where are my risks going forward? How would I do recovery and all that? I still have to think about those kinds of things regardless. So I can figure out for myself, Guy, and for Danita, who's going to do the coordination of the logistics, she might get a quarter of a day touch time to coordinate those logistics, two hours to do this and that, book the room, do whatever it was. It's just an example. And I would figure out what the various days are here in this activity. So I've broken, I've done a work breakdown structure on an activity, and I've just teased out for my needs, for my staffing, how I was going to staff this effort. That's what's important here. And if you've got different, more different roles in your organization, do different things here, you might need to think it's a little bit more complicated, or if it's just you doing it, the lone instructional designer, well then, it's the same person going to do this here. But I still like to tease out the difference between preparing for coordinating and logistics for it. Because coordinating and logistics for things is usually sometimes simple, sometimes not so. And preparing for it depends also. So I, write, like, I like people to think about those two separate things here, and that's just my bias. And you don't have to share my bias. You can do it any way you want. But that was important. So I can figure out touch time totals here. Now, those of you who understand uh, the, the long pole, the uh, critical path kind of a thing here in a, in a purchase <coughs> project evaluation review technique, um, I like that better than a Gantt chart because it shows me you know, what is that time that's going to be required. So here I've got the, 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 the long pull, the critical path here would be four and a half days because the coordination of the logistics can happen in parallel with the preparing for it. It's got to certainly happen before you conduct it. You know, booking the room after you try to start the meeting in the room is untimely. Um, but anyway, so that's it. So who's doing it? How much touch time is required to do those kinds of things? And then what kind of cycle time might I give them? I might give seven days, seven business days, for working on a business calendar, um, to get the five and a half days thing done. That's reasonable. If something goes wrong, you know, uh, I've had run meetings and had all the flip charts posted on the wall and had the cleaning crew come out and, and throw them all away that evening and come back in the morning and find out they're all gone, even though you wrote in English and in Spanish, <laughs> don't throw the paper around on the wall, not knowing that they were Polish. I couldn't read either. And luckily we had some anal retentive type in the room who took copious notes on everything we did and that's how we did recover. So we were able to actually document it after the meeting, but do. But so there's always a need to think about the difference between touch time and cycle time. And again, sometimes you don't have the luxury of giving yourself any wiggle room. So as always, it depends. What's the activity? Is it likely to have any issues, or no, our experience is we've got this one not. We won't have any problems with this, so I can plan tighter. And if I'm looking at a staff person, a consultant person, I'm trying to get higher utilization out of them, I know that I, I've got some, if I build in a lot of wiggle room here, that I'm just making them very inefficient with their time. I'm doing that as the planner. <clears throat> now, depending on how they're planning and, and managing their other projects here, that extra two and a half days probably hopefully going to another project someplace, so I'm getting that utilization out there. So again, depending on your context, depending on how, what you have to manage and plan for, and how all planning works across the board, <coughs> this may be an issue for you, this may not be. But I like to look at project plans and think about where I think it's going to go wrong. Somebody else did the plan, I'm going to look at it, because I'm going to live with the consequences of the margin being there or not being there at the end of this thing. Um, and I want to know whether or not they're thinking about those kinds of things. And so I'm trying to make it visible in their planning so that I can see if they've actually given thought to the plan. Or did they just take the last project's plan and change, do some word processing and change the name of the plan of the project, and that's it. We've got the same old plan. Well, that's no good because that's not giving very much thought to them in the situation. Scott? So, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, Pete. Can you go back, please? Yes. Uh, this is really cool. Uh, what I'm wondering is it seems like there's almost uh, two things happening. One, you've got a representation of uh, what somebody thinks they're going to be doing in their business. The other thing that you just said is that when you're able to look at this, 
you're looking at that and what you're essentially doing is does it hang together and are there risks and are we mitigating the risk? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a version of this form where you're looking at uh, the risk mitigation on a task by task basis or do you roll those into a higher level risk mitigation plan? Um, my risk mitigation plan is not formal. I don't normally document it because I was living with the consequences myself. But, I, but, many my clients, but many of my clients require that in their own planning processes. So if they had such a thing, I would just adapt or adopt theirs and use theirs. But that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about spreading some dates out here on this thing here for recovery. If we have to go to Rework City, it takes time to get there and get back. So you, know, it's, you, you plan to avoid things, but there are certain things that are unavoidable. So what's your contingency plan? If it's a true so report. your risk management plan is here. So I'm doing it in my head and talking with my. Uh, <coughs> way, I, I get into too many layers and, and, and documents of a plan thing here, and most of my project planning was most often simple. But there were times when we were fitting in with 17 other work streams, and we had to figure out, you know, when are we doing our things, and if we've got one deliverable or 17, you know, uh, lots of deliverables in that, then we have to stagger that. Then I would might have a more a, a documented uh, risk uh, a mitigation plan and a contingency plan. Because if it all goes to heck anyway, what are we going to do? And where are we going to do this? And where is the room for recovery? And those are the kinds of conversations I want to have with my clients in the very first gate review meeting where I share the project plan, walk them through it at a high level, let them dive deep on wherever they want to go so they can talk about it because they may understand where the quicksand is and I just think that's a sandy path here. And they may know that's going to be a problem. And that's what I want to talk to them about is let's get real together on this because we're all in this together here. So if you can see faults in my planning, I need to understand that so I can plan better for that, yes. Can you explain again how you got from roughly four and three quarters days to seven? Um, I just slapped, I just gave myself that much wiggle room. It was arbitrary. It was arbitrary. I just arbitrarily go, it takes four days to do something, give it an extra two. So is that something is that does that remain internal or is that something that your clients? My client will, could see that if they teased out and looked at the. Um, you know, my clients never pay for me to be on site. They're paying for my time, whether I'm doing anything or not. So they were just paying for the time that we believed that we were going to spend touching things here. So the fact that I gave myself a little bit of wiggle room here for whatever reason, because my consultant is working on another project, I'm going to give them some time and room for that. So that also went into my planning here, looking at multiple projects. Saying when is guy available? When is Pete available? Oh, they got another two-day meeting here, so I've got to actually factor that in. So that seven days could become ten days. They got four do it on this project, but they got another project in the calendar at the same time. So you're telling me that's not a random number? Um, not, not, no, it's not a random number, but sometimes it's a little bit arbitrary. Um, um, it's it's arbitrary based on your expertise, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah, prior, yeah. prior burnings and burnings. <laughs> there, there's therapy and scars associated yeah, with that. Yeah, exactly. So I think that that's the thing here. So the macro framework that I asked you to look at before was simply so you could look at this and say, how do I adapt something like this and fit that back into my Dumaic or my Abbey version here? And will this help me plan? Now, you may have already got some more sophisticated project planning concepts and tools and things like that in place here. This is for those of us who aren't using a Microsoft project on everything. I've never been able to use it. It wants me to hard schedule everything. <clears throat> I don't want to hard schedule everything. I want to hard schedule the things that where I have to show up face to face, be on a call. All the other work has to get done sometime, but I'm not going to schedule each and every task. So it's exactly when that coordinated logistics is going to be happening. I'm assuming it has to have been accomplished when it starts and actually when it was done. When, when did they spend the quarter, the day, the two hours, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes? There. I didn't want to schedule all that stuff. That would drive me crazy. And I need a lower tenant. All right, so uh, developing my career, for example, in project planning. I right, just so I don't test this up here. So as I do project planning here, I'm meeting with the client. That's the first big activity. Meet with the client. I go prepare for it, according to logistics for it, and maybe document something. Maybe it's simply writing notes to myself and not a formal documented thing. But I gotta do that because if I get hit by the bus. Somebody in my staff is going to have to pick it up and run with it from there. And so that's always part of my thinking, too, because that's happened to me on occasion here. We just don't blow deadlines because somebody ends up in the hospital. We collapse into the void and fill it and get going. That's what you got to do. So my next thing might have been um, meeting with other stakeholders after the initial meeting with the client and then documenting that. 
got to coordinate on their schedules, what I'm going to meet with them, yada, 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 yada. And then I might draft a project plan. And then my last thing in this first project planning is go hold the first gate review meeting and run the gauntlet with my clients and say, this is what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, who's going to do what, what the burden is on uses, and what the burden is on users. Because I'm going to tap into your people, your subject matter experts or master performers. I prefer master performers over subject matter experts. But uh, I want them to know that. This is the burden. This is the timing of it. We're holding a three-day meeting to do analysis, and this is where we're going to do it, and this is the dates, and this is the people you've got to have show up. Give me your top-tier players. I'll give you a top-tier product. Give me your middle-of-the-road players. I'll give you a middle-of-the-road project. Give me your worst players. I'll give you a lousy product. Business decision. Hey, we're going to support this thing. So I want to have some clarity about that. When I do analysis here, I'm looking at target audiences. Getting all the information I need about the target audience. Who's coming? What can we safely assume? What can't we assume about what they know and don't know? Or whatever the context is. I'm talking about all the structural kinds of things here. I apologize for that, but that's most of the <coughs> And then I'm going to look at what are the, what's the performance and the enabling knowledge and skills. That's my next big activity. Then I'm going to scour their library of instructional and informational content so I can see what can I reuse. I hate creating redundant content. So my, my last block, activity block here, is another gate review meeting, where I'm going to read out all that analysis data and check in with them and see. If I've asked them to empower an analysis team of master performers, I'm going to show them, here's the data. What do you want to look at? I'll walk you through it at a high level. You want to dive deep on anything? We can go deep. But I've got it here. To empower them, I've captured what they had to say about this thing. As we agreed earlier in the first phase, that's what we did in the second phase. Now let's talk about the issues going forward. So I've got four major block activities in my analysis phase. Now if I'd also included a survey in there, I'd have a fifth block. And if I was going to take the analysis data and review with additional master performers and more people from the target audience and run another kind of review meeting, that would have been another block that I would have added in there. And I've got to figure out the touch time on all that stuff, the cycle time to make that happen. You know, and their schedules may drive my scheduling and give me even more wiggle room in there. But that should have been all planned in the very first phase of exactly what of these activity blocks are doing. So I'm just trying to demystify my model here and figure out yours. Yes. When you do these, you're doing an estimating the time. Do you go back and look at the track? Yeah. yeah, always. That's how I know that I'm not going to do change orders because I know how long it takes to do this stuff within reason. Close enough. Because I like to tell my clients every number is wrong. I hope that within the aggregate we're within 10%. But every number is wrong. Not any one of those numbers is ever right. If it was, it was just a coincidence. I should have been at the racetrack or the line. <laughs> okay. How do so, you use this to do the monitoring? Or do you have other tools that you use? I just simply track. I've historically tracked every person's time by phase, not by activity. Phase is close enough. Uh, on a spreadsheet? Uh, well, uh, it, because it goes into my invoicing system, which either it either is used for a time and expense invoicing, or I know what I'm going to invoice them anyway, but I'm using the same system to track all that time, so everybody had to report their time in. Some people had to report it in daily, because they could never remember by the end of the week, and consultants on the road had to do it by weekly. And I just learned, because I got burned on that stuff too early. Do you, do you have a project that you can share that has each of these yellow blocks blown out, this high level, that you hang your hat on and it's used as a benchmark for uh, it's in it's in my book, Lean ISD, which is available as a free PDF on my website at epic.biz. That should be on these handouts someplace. But I've got a book in there, and I've got a time frame that I've used to estimate for various resources, the consultant and the, and the word processing people. And I've got a timetable in there as a, kind of my, my starting point. Yeah. And out on another uh, wiki that I've got, uh, I've got actually a project plan for a curriculum architecture design project, full blown, but I don't have the Abbey version out there with all the details in there. But the time is out there. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, uh, let me see at the end of the session here where that is, but if you go to my epic.biz website, there's a link there to my blog, and on my blog there's a link there to the PAC wiki. <coughs> so it's a convoluted tab. But, uh, I'm playing with all the web you got this stuff here. Trying to get into it. All right, so the same thing with design, and I hold a design meeting in my world, I bring my master performance together and do the design with them there in the room, so that they're critiquing it, and then I document and I go to gate review meeting. In development here, I might do the first draft, the second draft, the third draft, and then we're doing the pilot test prep. My rule of thumb is always, 
you get three drafts, that's it. Unless it was the lesson from Hades, then you get five drafts. We always want to recognize which of the lessons are the lessons of the things we're going to build are the ones from Hades. You know, the hellacious ones. The ones that we already know, we're like two months behind already on day one. The ones that will take forever. The ones that we may actually go to the pilot test and actually have to create some of the content in the pilot test because it's that. Because the engineers or somebody hasn't figured it out yet. And we don't think that they will. And if we wait for them, we wait forever. So we go to market with a partial thing and then do continuous improvement rather than deferring to perfection. And learn how to be in depth with that. Pilot test, conduct the pilot, and then spend a whole activity just analyzing the heck out of all the data that we collected after every lesson, at the end of the day, or however you do your pilot test and evaluations of the pilot test. But I evaluate the heck out of it. 16 ways from Sunday, I tell the clients. And that's the only time we're ever going to do it to this level, unless it, we have major revisions and then the very first delivery of the course or deployment or however you're doing it, uh, on demand situation or web-based training or whatever, then we may do a higher level of evaluation for the first few deliveries so we can work out any additional kinks. But anyway, I was trying to minimize all that. So my rule was I want no more than 10% revisions by the time we get to the sixth phase here. And if we did it right beforehand, we should have minimal kinds of things unless the product was unstable or the content was unstable for whatever reason, it's highly volatile stuff. That happens too. We got to work with that. So then I would have updated really sit in my last box to all the PMI for this moment. That last activity is lessons learned. How much time did this really take? Look at the plan. Pete, you did the planning. Let's look at how it came out. I was able to tell my two business partners I have the best uh, estimating uh, ability in our company. Ray, <laughs> you are always 10, 15, 20% under what it really takes. We have less margin on your projects at the end of them. And the other business partner, you are a little bit over as well. So you could come down to some of your estimates and I can tell you which phases you were doing, you know, you were better at than others. <clears throat> Because I was a business partner and one third of those profits, that margin was mine. So, and I'm the one who put on all these systems here and drove them crazy because I started tracking them too. As well as our other consultants that. And I told my production people, don't even worry here. Sometimes we just gain it by reducing your number to bring the price down or whatever. You know, there's things that you do. So I said, I, you know, some clients just hate to see them. Five days of documentation? Yeah, they don't realize how much stuff we're going to gather in a meeting and how long it's going to take that to pull it all together. But anyway, so that's just my example of taking my addy like model, my adapted macro framework, and how I've used the micro thing inside of it. Okay? So how would you adapt? This is your next exercise coming up. That's up. So how would you adapt that conducted document? What would you do on the front end before that? Do you need to do any other things uh, in between here, any other quality assurance steps here? How would you adapt? the micro activity block for your purposes, for how you staff projects. Me, it was simple. I had a consultant and a non-consultant. And I just had to divide and conquer that way. Your situation may be more complex. I don't know. Well, maybe you can adapt what I've got. What's it here? Adopt it. Adapt it. So how many players are typical? How do you typically break out the discrete tasks? Every situational context is a little bit different. Sometimes I had to adapt this kind of a model for my clients because we had to build in extra things for them. But it was rare. Adapt the activity block diagram to meet your needs and criteria. Maybe you have to run a pre-review before you do a review. Or maybe you have to go through a, a document and a quality assurance step after you've documented. I had an editor proofreader on staff. They looked at everything. Nothing went out the door theoretically without them signing off on it. But I just included that in the documentation thing. Can you, can you just adopt this? Or might you need to adapt it? No adapt it? No yeah, adaptation needed? Depending on the size of the projects, I would undertake. I may need to do a secondary kind of approval step. Okay. Uh, only because I, you know, I work with the first. So before I actually do the contact, I have to go back to this plan. All right, that could be another just activity block. 
So in the activity block, it's right now you're thinking about do I how many how do I staff the projects? Do I have a different kinds of uh, do I have a coordinator on the staff and a documentation specialist or and then a consultant type or whatever? I played with this uh, many times. Let me just back up here. Uh, I played with this many times here uh, before I got to this and I first delivered this at uh, uh, in 2001. Purdue to a structural design class that was going on there. It was the first time I actually went public other than teaching my own staff with this thing here. But they were students and I don't think they were all at a point here where they were uh, privy to, they had been burned enough to have learned enough to have decided that something like this might be of help. And my only purpose of this is to create some visibility of this, to create a pattern in the tasks in a phase of a project. I want to see a task that says coordinate the logistics for that whatever that next thing is, that meeting, that activity. Prepare for it. If you're going to have to prepare for it, I'm, I want to charge the clients for our touch time on that stuff, so make that a discrete task. Then do the thing, whatever it was that we were going to go do. Make that a discrete task. I want to see that separately. And then I want to see that documentation task in this word that way. And my clients are going to go, this is the pattern. I go, good, you make a good analyst. Yeah, good analysts recognize patterns, good designers, great patterns. I like how you have the uh, buy-in of the individual that's going to be doing those tasks. Yes. I like that because it gives them onus of their time. Mm -hmm. But um, I also like how it, this is because then you can, if you're pressed for time and delivery, that you can go back and adjust and maybe, okay, this part isn't as critical as this piece is, and go back through and have them readjust. Mm -hmm. Where they could actually start you know, knocking a day or so to get it done. Right. I like that. And I, I think it helps my staff that they <coughs> force the tracking of their time by project, simply by phase, not by task number, right. just by phase. Then we can have an intelligent conversation about what time it really takes to do this. And to sharpen the planner's skills. So the reality is the reality is the reality is. And if it takes longer to do this stuff and somebody keeps on shorting them the available time, it always made my production staff quite crazy when the consultants who developed these project plans didn't give them enough time. And but so, it also teaches them, from your perspective as a manager, it grows them to see, yeah, those things <coughs> are not always going to be set to stand. Mm -hmm. You're going to have this much time. The beauty of my system, too, was that my, my production staff actually typed up the project plan, did the word processing of it, so they would see those numbers in there, and then they would come to their go, go to their boss and they go right to my office and say, they're not giving us enough time here, or God, you're not giving us enough time here, because I was an author of these things, too. Um, so I was able to build templates, and I could just go in and edit these things. On my PAC wiki, what I did is for a curriculum architecture design project, which has got four phases, but this is adaptable, you can but I've got a Word document out there that you can download and then you can edit it to meet the language requirements that you have. You can add in the extra tasks that you need to do. And you should be able to look at that and see this pattern in my task statements in my schedule. So that was all very important to me um, that, that I can see it, the clients can see it, the staff can see it, it's demystified, this is how we think about it, it's our little work breakdown structure, it's got four pieces. Plan. Prepare for it, coordinate it, do it, document it, done. On to the next micro activity block. And that's where a lot of variance can happen. And also, I can see, and I want to show you uh, prior here, this one here. Um, now, that looks kind of linear and, and serious and all that stuff. And in truth, if I were to print this out, it would look a lot different. Because there's a lot of things that I can do, coordinating the logistics for things, uh, way early. I can work the logistics for all the meeting rooms in the first phase. As soon as the client says, buys it, and I'm at, doing the final thing after the gate review meeting here, I can go book all the rooms. Or work with my client almost often. So they would book the rooms, and the appropriate room, rather than scrambling for uh, the room the right size at the last minute, you know, too late is usually too late. Actually, it's a, it's a 
I've got a Word document for the narratives of my project plan, and then I use Excel for these for task charts, and that's what you'll see out there on the pack wiki. And then I just edit those. I use those templates. It's, it reduces uh, project planning time uh, from the old days of two days to about two hours. And the other beautiful thing about this activity block diagram, when I get called into a client's office here, I can talk to them. I can put my framework up there and then do these activities right in front of their very eyes, put in the names of the people and the amounts of time, go down to the bottom right-hand corner here and go, guy, and his daily rate is this, and the production person is this, add up all those times, doing it right in front of their very eyes. Add it all up, price it all out there, go, that would be the time and expense thing. Of course, I could be wrong with these numbers. It happens. And, or I'll put the 20% margin on there and that would be your price. How do you want me to write this up when I go back home? Your call. Oh, you don't even have to decide now. Call me in the morning and then I'll write it up a certain way you want. Because I'm going to have to write the project plan up here. It's just how I do the pricing. So it was demystified for the client. They could go, hey, I think you're sandbagging me here or there. But I never, ever, 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 ever heard that because I broke it down right in front of their eyes and talked and thought out loud as to what's going on. And why I'm going to give more wiggle room right here because of the thing you said about an hour ago or 15 minutes ago. You said something and that causes me dissonance. <laughs> Visceral dissonance. <laughs> I got the willies now about that thing here. And so that's why I'm bumping that time up right there. Normally I would call that three days. I'm going to call that five days. You're going to pay for the five days thing to what you said earlier. And that's how I'm thinking about it. So push back now if you want me to. Don't be pushing back at me a whole second <coughs> after I've gone through the trouble of documenting all of this stuff here. And that's worked wonderfully. And my, my, uh, many of my clients have said, wow, <laughs> I don't know if any of those numbers are right. That's what I would say. Remind me, every number is wrong in the accurate. I hope it's within 10%, 15% at the most. But now you know how I'm going to think about how I'm going to do it, how I'm going to price it, all of that stuff. Mystery solved. Yes, sir. So is this uh, your faces across the top? Are those just an example of phases for a project, or is this something you replicate across any project? That's what I would tend to use probably 90% of the time when I'm doing an addy kind of thing. And this is regardless of the medium, delivery medium, classroom? Oh, yeah, you know. sure. I mean, it's just in the development acquisition thing, the acquisition order is there because I'm reusing content, hopefully. i got to remind everybody that that's what we're all about, <laughs> saving shareholder equity by reusing stuff they already paid for. But the development thing here is just how much time do I get? You know, if I've got to build storyboards, I've got to you know, do, do whatever the web-based training process is for that, that's just a different set of activity blocks than if I'm doing instructor-led training. We've had um, success with iterative prototyping, uh -huh. uh, where that analysis and design has kind of a sub-cycle within it. Mm -hmm. And that way, when you get to your later phases, you're pretty much, your design is locked down and your content is, is distilled down sure. to what it's got to be. Um, and I, don't, I assume that that is either, well, no, I shouldn't assume. Have you used that? Um, no, I have not because, one, I hate iterations unnecessarily. And, but, but I think it's a, a language and uh, more of that issue here. I'm usually meeting, I'm doing my analysis in a room with face-to-face -face with master performers and we identify what's the performance look like, what are the outputs, what are the measures, what are the tasks, what are the various roles and responsibilities, and what are the gaps against that. If ideal performance looks like this, what are the gaps? And then I go look for, and then I tease out all the enabling knowledge and skills. We've got 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills, so we leave no stone unturned do that in a meeting with them so that they buy into it. They own the analysis data. Um, if it's about prototyping things because we want to look at to see what the look and feel is of the deliverable, um, they should know what the look and feel is going to be. I'm really more interested in what's the terminal performance that we're going to train to, what are the enabling knowledge and skills so I know what my terminal objectives are, what my enabling objectives are, and then I'm going to go looking for existing content to see what is I can just design around. So once I have all that, then I'll go into the meeting with my master performers and do the design with them so they can do the feasibility testing right there. Guy, that's a great idea, but it ain't going to work in our real world. Oh, okay, so what would you do? So as I facilitate my design team in taking the analysis data and creating a design with the analysis data, because I hate to gather analysis data that doesn't make it into design. Saw so too much of that when I, you know, early in my career. You gathered all that data there, but I don't see how you ever used it downstream. What the heck? So, so I've tried to pare down exactly what I capture based on what I need in the next step. 
So I'm deferring some things. But so when I get to the development acquisition, we probably already decided in phase one, how are we going to deliver this? But we can still change our minds going through the project. What are the authoring tools we're going to use or templates that you might have? So yeah, so we're doing rapid program. Now I can do all of that without the gate review meetings. That's a little traffic upside down traffic light in the picture here. But I can do analysis, design, and development in one meeting. Clients want to do that. You know, if you're doing short modules, one hour modules, yeah, that's two hour modules. Yeah, you can probably do something like that. But if you're going to build a three week course or something more complex that's trickier, then you probably want to stop at some point and do a check-in with the client. This is what we got. This is, you, you handpicked the people that we got it from, so you empowered them, so either you know something that they don't know, which means we need to make an adjustment here before we design around this analysis data. The same thing with development. This is the design. This is the flow of the content. This is how it's going to be. Here's the information we're going to give, demonstrations, application exercises. Here's how we broke out the lessons or whatever. So we demystify all that so that the clients can all buy into that. Now they don't get to see maybe what it looks like unless they're familiar with what does our web-based training typically look like. What's the color scheme we use? What's the font size? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they don't get a chance to look at the final product, but they should have real clarity about the analysis data shows you exactly what we're going to train to. People are going to be able to perform tasks to produce outputs to meet certain measurements, requirements. And my clients usually look at that and go, yeah, that's exactly what we want to have. We want everybody to be like those master performers we gave, which is what we're trying to do. Use master performance for the consensus model of mastery performance. Have them identify all of the enabling knowledge and skills. Never talk to master performers subject matter one-on-one, -on -one, because they don't know what they really do. But you can get a room full of them together, they will self-correct each other all day <laughs> long. Especially when guy says, <coughs> your name's out of this thing here. You're the ones who said what this is. I'm in the process. You own the content. So if this is all garbage, it all reflects poorly on you. And just to up the ante, to get their, their skin in the game here. So, but that's a lesson I learned a long time ago that if you, know, if you talk with people one on one, they don't know. I forget what the number is, what percentage is that people miss when they tell you what they do. But you get a room full of them together, and you tend to miss a lot less. But of course, just because master performers come to consensus on something doesn't make them actually right either, right? I mean, we get real here. Um, so, but who else would you ask other than master performers? And if you're trying to study some, some process that takes a three-year cycle, like brand management in the auto industry, you don't get to observe them for that and then come up with your training recommendations afterwards. So, you, so some things, yeah, you need to do the observations and you need to do a behavioral analysis and a cognitive analysis. And these two guys come back here and have the cognitive Somebody said three things about your session the other day about kinds of analysis. So you should go see their session from the other day. Next year. So you're you're only dealing with uh, quote unquote master performance. So when you're doing your gap analysis, you don't have end users in that group? Uh, they're the master performers. They are the end users. They know typically why other people aren't master performers. What's what's hanging them up, what they what tricks of the trade they haven't learned yet, what uh, what secrets that uh, They've each developed that other people don't know about. You know, I tell them if they only ask me, but we haven't too often asked here, except in knowledge and in context and social networks and things like that. So there's lots of stuff coming around to do that. Let me, let me advance sure. here. Um, so we'll not do that exercise to you can all adopt it versus adapt it, or you'll figure out later what you really need to do. Project management strategy. What would you need to monitor for or possibly troubleshoot? Uh, I like to do this. Via, via the meetings themselves and the gate review meetings. So when I have mass performers in there, we're kind of self-checking each other, guys writing stuff down. I say, you know, somebody says something, they're brave enough to say something, I write it down, then I turn to look to the group to see if that was correct. I talk to my analysts. Somebody tells you something, don't stand there with the pen. Because I think you're signaling that they, that they didn't get it right. <laughs> and what would you know? You're just the facilitator of the room. You're not a mass performer. Whatever somebody says, write it down. Check with the rest of the group if they all can tie in on that. They may want to wordsmith it. That's all fine. That's good. So, so, but then I take things to gate review meetings. And I can combine my analysis and design phase and shorten the cycle time here and do the gate review meeting after the design. But I got to let my client know what might be an issue with that. Now, we can mitigate that issue by putting one of the steering team people into the process so that they could make the political decisions of, yeah, we buy this, let's keep moving. Well, that's fine. But otherwise, if you're introducing risks, 
you're not doing enough check-ins at a timely fashion. Those milestone reviews, those gate review meetings, those toll gate meetings, you know, lots of language for the same stuff over the last 30 years. But that's, that's what I do. And I take them the whole stinking deck of data, whatever it is, the analysis and design, and I put it in front of them and I say, you can leave it here when you leave, or you can take it home with you, or we'll ship it home. You might want to take it home and have somebody else look at it. You may not have the time nor inclination to look at this kind of stuff here. But I want to make it available to you. But otherwise, if you don't look at it thoroughly, you've empowered that other group to generate this, and that's what we've done. You either trust them or you don't. Or there's secret stuff going on in the background that we don't know about that we might have tripped over, like we're counting on using this particular tool, and you guys are contemplating replacing it at some point soon, and, but no one knows that, so you don't stir up the hornet's nest. That's important to do those check-ins. But I find the check-ins are more important because I may not use my gate review meeting to review what we just did, but to talk about what we're going to do next and what we learned just recently here and what, how might we change or think about going forward differently. So that's just important rather than reviewing the data here and then blindly just going off and going into the next phase and doing it however you thought you were going to do it. Did you learn anything in this last phase that's going to do minor adjustments of your thinking or your process or what you're going to collect in the next phase or what you're going to do in the next phase? Maybe you need to bring in new players into the next phase, which is always the kiss of death, slowness. Because they've got to reinvent all the analysis data since they weren't there to create it. Which is what I tell steering teams in the very early day where you mean, if you do that to me, I'm going to charge you extra to have that thorough briefing of the new player with all this data. Because otherwise they're going to take our three-day design meeting and spend the first two and a half days redoing the analysis data, which means we've got a half a day to do a three-day job. You know, that's, that's usually ends up not so good. Uh, monitoring by walking around, talking with the project effort participants and stakeholders. <coughs> if you can't do formal check-in meetings and that, you still got to get the job, job done anyway. A lot of companies dislike meetings, dislike gate review meetings, don't like the formality of project plans with phases and tasks and all that spilled out. They like to uh, just navigate the waters, however the water, the river is flowing that day. So, so there's other ways of doing that, and you may have to do both. And of course, remember the number one rule of all number one rules? When you go into steering team review meetings or you go into any kind of meeting, allow no surprises. If you think there's going to be a surprise in what you're going to do, don't hit everybody in the meeting all together at once. Go brief every single person individually, or just the key players individually. No surprises. If you don't like them, why would they? What else do you use to do, uh, what strategies and tactics do you use to manage projects, to troubleshoot things when they happen? How do you, what do you guys use? Do you, how many do you use milestone kind of gate review meetings and things like that? Formal, not so formal? No, 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 Sometimes it's safe things. Sometimes it's formal, sometimes. Okay. And it's situational, so just because I've got a model to do it, it looks very rigorous, it's very, I think it's very flexible, at least it allows me to know where I'm going to do the formal thing, where I'm going to do it informally. Nonetheless, I believe I have to get it done. Nonetheless, somebody's got to actually coordinate the logistics for most of the things you're going to go do, those big activities. You just can't show up and go, hey, let's find a room for the 12 of us. <laughs> and I, where do we order coffee? Oh, well, you can't? Oh, starting off on the wrong foot. Anyway, so those are some of the things that I use. I believe that creating the visibility of the planning effort, um, and that would be the last exercise there, so you'll need to give some thought to that. But, there's lots of good project planning and management books and articles and things like that. Our society's got a Judy Hales all into the implementation and stuff. And lots of other people before her, too. We have a, a rich archive. If those of you who are members can get on the, on the Wiley uh, publications and go look at the past uh, performance improvement journals and go do searches for those kinds of things. We have lots of stuff. We have lots of people here. Uh, I do very unsophisticated project planning. I don't know how to use project. I don't want to, because it's overkill and extreme for my needs. And if I need somebody to do that, I find somebody to do that for me. Because I'm only going to do it a couple of times in my life, from here on out, before I die. Um, <laughs> I, but I appreciate that I'm going to have to do that. And at Wachovia, I have somebody on my staff who's, I've got several PMI certified folks here, and they use the enterprise project management methodology, the formal stuff. And we know exactly when we have to do the lesson reviews, uh, lessons learned, and document those, and where those go, and all that stuff. And again. I don't want to know it. I got a specialist to do that for me. My thing is the instructional gate, not necessarily the project planning at that level. There's a time and a place for that. 
there's a time and a place to do a two-pager, there's a time and a place to project manage and plan in your head and then go do it and not document it, review it, do all those kinds of things. So you just need to be able to scale up and down the levels of uh, formality. But nonetheless, do it. Yes? You know, you said something earlier and I didn't comment, Guy, but you're so right, is that people consistently, there will be people who always underestimate it, and they're consistent on any project. God there will love be them. people who, who always get it right, but it might be at a quality perspective because mm -hmm. you know they're going to meet those time frames but that happens over on people who will underestimate but you know it happens over and over and over again across projects across classes across mm -hmm. topics across media and so it's just they're overly optimistic or, or overly pessimistic or yeah. they're willing to sacrifice any quality to meet a deadline right yeah and, and, and 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 that's it i'm going to turn in what i have at that moment mm -hmm. i turn it into a function I, and I think that it's important when you when you can show the client, okay, this is what your schedule is forcing me to do. Now, there's often a lot of arbitrariness in schedules. Not every time, but a lot of times. You know, managers feel their job is you tell them 10, they can say, how about five? Do it or five. Because they've learned that that sometimes works. It gets done in five. Well enough. So, so I like to be able to show my clients, okay, if I have to meet your schedule, here's how I've squeezed it. And here's now the risks that have popped up. And if we were to do this in a more ideal fashion, not that we should do it the ideal way all the time, but basically here's what that would look like. Could you live with that? So there's been times when I've done, done the planning uh, two different ways because I knew that I, I sensed that the scheduled deadline was arbitrary. Made up. <laughs> Pulled out of the thin air. Is one of the ways. Uh, but so that happens and so I want to just be real with them. And if I, if I could show them exactly how long I can, how quickly I can do this and that I don't get caught in analysis paralysis. Thank you very much. I get it done. I get, get what I need for the next step. I can show them how to do that. that then, they, then they usually feel it's more reasonable. And I, get a, I get a lot of people who absolutely did want to do the planning, did want to do that. I did it in front of their eyes on their whiteboard, like I was suggesting. And they saw it all. They go, well, that's reasonable. So I, when you turn a skeptic, the whole world can come with you. Because people that Bob bought that? Well, who am I to work with that? I would certainly wouldn't want to get it his way. And usually one of the things that one of the other strategies I use, I go, give me the worst skeptic you got. Give me the tough, no-nonsense business person here who just hates training and trainers and folks like me. Let me work with them. Because all i got to do is turn them. And then they turn everybody else with me. I've had managers stand up in a meeting and attack me and have my, the tough guy, this was back in the Motorola days in the early 80s, uh, uh, Mike stood up and, and said, sit down, we got this covered. And so everybody goes, okay, whatever we were going to do was going to be fine and they were going to do it that way. I was not going to hear one peep out of the other 30 of them. Well, you covered all, all your bases, period. Exactly. You know, and you've got the operational measure of have we covered all of our bases. Bob says so. Thank you, everyone. Please fill out your evaluations. Here is the... Uh, I do stuff at Wiki Spaces, but it's called uh, the Pack Wiki. But you'll see it on this blog here on the sidebar. You can use several other of my uh, Web 2.0 resources that I've been playing with. And you said you covered this in Lean ISD. I cover, yeah, this, this is covered in my book Lean ISD, which is available at this desktop. It's a free PDF. I've got three other books there also. It all kind of tied together with this kind of stuff. But you can get some book as a Kindle book or a hardbound book through Amazon. But I'm going to use this